Good morning. The Roper Technologies conference call will now begin. Today's call is being recorded. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing star and zero. I would now like to turn the call over to Zach Moxie, Vice President, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thank you all for joining us as we discuss the fourth quarter and full year financial results for Roper Technologies. We hope everyone's doing well. Joining me on the call this morning are Neil Hun, President and Chief Executive Officer, Rob Creasy, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, Jason Conley, Vice President Controller, and Shannon O'Callaghan, Vice President of Finance. Earlier this morning, we issued a press release announcing our financial results. The press release also includes replay information for today's call. We have prepared slides to accompany today's call, which are available through the webcast and are also available on our website. Now, if you'll please turn to slide two. We begin with our safe harbor statement. During the course of today's call, we will make forward-looking statements which are subject to risks and uncertainties as described on this page in our press release and in our SEC filings. You should listen to today's call in the context of that information. And now please turn to slide three. Today, we will discuss our results for the quarter and year primarily on an adjusted non-GAAP basis. Reconciliations between GAAP and adjusted measures can be found in our press release and in the appendix of this presentation on our website. For the fourth quarter, the difference between our GAAP results and adjusted results consists of the following items. Amortization of acquisition-related intangible assets, purchase accounting adjustments to acquire deferred revenue, and related commission expense, and lastly, transaction-related expenses for completed acquisition. And now, if you'll please turn to slide four, I'll hand the call over to Neil. After our prepared remarks, we will take questions from our telephone participants. Neil? Thanks, Zach, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us, and we hope everyone is doing well. For today's agenda, we'll walk through our 2020 financials and operational highlights. Then we'll turn to our 2020 segment detailed results and discuss our 21 segment by segment outlook and end with our 21 enterprise guidance prior to discussing your questions. Next slide, please. As we look back on 2020, it was quite a year. Our businesses performed at a very high level during this period. Revenues grew 3% with organic revenue declining a single percent. EBITDA also grew 3% and free cash flow grew 16%. This cash flow perform performance, 1.7 billion, is just astounding. This is a testament to many things, notably our asset light business model, the intimacy we have with our customers, and the high level of skill and execution of our field teams. This cash flow is just simply a great result. Perhaps more important, 2020 was a year of forward progress for our company. We exit 2020 as a better company, a company with higher quality revenue streams, a company with improved future innovation prospects, and a company with whose portfolio had, was enhanced with $6 billion of capital deployment. To this end, we saw our software recurring revenues increase mid single digits in 2020 and were benefited by high levels of retention and an acceleration to the cloud. We continue to be benefited by having close, intimate relationships with our customers. Most often, our software is mission critical to our customers' operations. In addition, we continue to strategically invest throughout our portfolio during the year. Based on our historical experience, we find times of market disruption the best time to double down on innovation and market investments, which, in turn, will drive market share gains in the years to come. Finally, we're able to deploy $6 billion to further enhance Roper's group of companies, headlined by our Verta4 acquisition. So when we look back on 2020, we highlight two key themes. First, we grew. Cash flow increased 16% in the middle of a pandemic. And second, the quality of our enterprise continued to improve during the year. Net-net, we got bigger and better during 2020. Let's turn to the next slide. Over the past five years, we highlight that our revenue grew at a 9% compounded rate, EBITDA at 10%, and cash flow at 13%. We continue to grow and compound through macroeconomic cycles. Also, during the time period, the quality of our enterprise meaningfully improved. 
We are more software focused with nearly two thirds of our EBITDA coming from software with higher levels of recurring revenue. Conversely, we are much less tied to cyclical end markets today, a little over 15% of our portfolio. Given our long-term strategy and these factors, we are a low risk enterprise. We compound cash flow through cycle and do so with multiple growth drivers across both organic and inorganic fronts. As we look to 21, we will continue our long-term string of revenue and EBITDA and cash flow compounding. So with that, let's turn to the next page and discuss the macro backdrop for 21. As we look to 2021, we are set up for a strong year. We expect revenue and EBITDA will grow well into the double digits, likely in the mid-teens range, with organic revenue growth in the mid-single digit plus range. This is on top of growth in 2020. The compounding continues. Breaking it down, our software businesses, both in our application software and network segments, are well positioned heading into 21. These businesses enter the year with momentum from strong retention and recurring revenue gains. They'll be further aided by growth and perpetual license as pipeline and customer activity are anticipated to recover to some extent. Our non-Varathon medical product businesses are expected to return to a more normalized pattern of customer activity as healthcare facilities loosen restrictions, but since 2020 was well below trend, we expect above trend growth here. Of note, Varathon has a challenging comp. However, their reoccurring revenue base will remain strong given the large volume of capital placements in 2020 and continued growth of their new single-use bronchoscope business. We expect Neptune to recover and grow nicely as their customers, especially in the Northeast U.S. and Canada, gain access to residential locations. We expect our industrial and process tech businesses to continue their quarterly improvements and return to growth after two years of macro headwinds. Finally, 2021 will be meaningfully aided by the contribution from our 2020 cohort of acquisitions. To this end, we continue to work with a very full and high quality M&A pipeline. We are committed to deleveraging, but we also remain active in building and maturing our pipe. So as I think back over the nearly 10 years I've been with Roper, I cannot think of a better set of tailwinds heading into a year. Clearly lots to do and lots of execution in front of us, but we have a strong momentum heading into 21. So now let me turn the call over to Rob. Rob? Thanks, Neil. Good morning, everyone. Uh, turning to page eight, uh, looking at our Q4 income statement performance, total revenue increased 8% as we eclipsed 1.5 billion of quarterly revenue for the first time. Organic revenue for the enterprise declined 2% versus prior year. EBITDA grew 7% in the quarter to a record $552 million. EBITDA margin was down 40 basis points versus prior year at 36.6%. Tax rate came in at 19.9%, a little lower than last year's 21.6%. So all in, this resulted in adjusted diluted, diluted earnings per share of $3.56, which was above our guidance range. Next slide. Turning to page 9, we're viewing the Q4 results by segment. Uh, Neil will discuss the full year 2020 segment performance in more detail later, so just touching on some of the Q4 highlights here by segment. Application software grew 35% with the addition of Vertifor. Organic for the segment was minus 2, with mid-single digit recurring revenue growth continuing. Sharp declines in our seaboard and horizon businesses serving K-12 and higher education impacted the segment, as many schools unfortunately remain closed. For network software and systems, plus 2% organic growth with our software businesses, putting up a very solid plus 4% organic. Transcore was flat versus prior year. For measurement and analytical solutions, uh, plus 1% organic growth as we start to see some sequential recovery at Neptune and our industrial businesses. Segment margins were impacted a bit by the acceleration of some product and channel investments at Verathon, as we discussed coming into the quarter, uh, and it's really been an exceptional year for Verathon overall. Lastly, for process technologies, a 21% organic decline with margins holding up well at 31.3%. And once again here, we started to see some early signs of improvement after a couple of years of decline. Next slide. 
So turning to page 10, uh, looking at networking capital, uh, honestly, the slide mostly speaks for itself, ending the quarter with negative 8% networking capital as a percentage of Q4 annualized revenue. Uh, while there are certainly some seasonal trends, primarily around timing of software renewals, uh, that do typically benefit our Q4 performance, you can see here a meaningful improvement versus 2018, improving from negative 3.4% to negative 8% in 2020. Our asset light negative networking capital model drives our sustainable high cash conversion and fuels our cash flow compound. Our people focus on what we all believe matters and our culture is built around growing the right way. Top line growth converts to cash flow and we are always mindful of impacts to our balance sheet. Next slide. So turning to cash flow, uh, cash flow performance, as Neil mentioned, was really pretty spectacular no matter how you look at it. Q4 free cash flow, $558 million, was 23% higher than last year and represented 37% of revenue. This excellent result was driven by the great working capital performance I just, I just discussed, which is really across the enterprise, uh, along with meaningful cash contribution from Vertifor and the other recent acquisitions. So for the full year of 2020, we generated $1.72 billion of operating cash flow and $1.67 billion of free cash flow. So to repeat, that's $1.7 billion of free cash flow in 2020. Truly a great year. Full year free cash flow growth was 16%, and our free cash flow conversion from EBITDA was a robust 84%. So really tremendous cash flow performance, and it was broad-based and very durable. Next slide. So turning to page 12, updating on our balance sheet. As Neil mentioned earlier, we ended the year with total capital deployment of approximately $6 billion, which included the EPSI acquisition that closed during the fourth quarter on October 15th. We were able to take advantage of attractive market conditions to complete and opportunistically fund these acquisitions with a combination of internally generated cash flow, proceeds from our 2019 GATAM divestiture, and investment-grade leverage. Overall cost of financing was approximately 1%. Thanks to our excellent Q4 cash performance, we are off to a great start on our plan to quickly reduce leverage, paying down around $500 million since we closed the EPSI deal. Looking ahead, we plan to rapidly reduce leverage throughout 2021, taking advantage of our prepayable revolver, which has a current balance of approximately $1.6 billion. Our solid investment grade balance sheet supports long-term cash flow comp compounding, which we are well positioned to continue. So with that, I'll pass it back over to Neil for the remainder of, the, of our prepared remarks. Thanks, Rob. Let's turn to our recap for 2020. To help orient you to this page, we're comparing a full year outlook from last April to that of what actually happened. It's worth reminding everyone that we felt our businesses and our business model had the level of recurring revenue, customer intimacy, and the business leadership required to guide in the face of the COVID uncertainty, both in terms of supply and demand. In aggregate, we thought our full year organic revenues would be plus or minus flat, and we came in at down minus one. The Transcore New York project is the primary reconciling item between, between being down a touch and being flat or slightly up, and more on this in a minute. We guided depths to be between 1160 and 1260 and came in at 1274. Looking back on this, we are very proud of our team's ability to look forward and operate through the uncertainty of last year. Also, there is no better example of the durability of our model than this past year. With that, let's walk through the macro drivers across each of our four segments. Relative to application software, this segment played out as anticipated and was up 1% on an organic basis for the year. Specifically, we saw recurring revenue up mid-single digits, aided by very strong retention rates, as well as an acceleration to the cloud. As a reminder, recurring revenue in this segment is about 70% of our revenue stream. Perpetual revenues, about 10% of this segment's revenue, were under pressure as expected. We saw this revenue stream down mid-teens as new logo opportunities and wins were pushed and delayed. That said, cross-selling activity remained active for much of 2020. Relative to services revenue, we anticipated some pressure tied to shifting to remote installs and having fewer new implementations, which are tied to new perpetual transactions. For 2020, we saw mid-single-digit declines here, principally tied to fewer new deals. 
Our teams did a wonderful job shifting to remote installs, a trend we anticipate will continue in large part on the backside of the pandemic. As it relates to our network segment, we expected organic revenue for the year to be up mid-singles to double digits when, in fact, we grew 3% for the full year. Our network software businesses performed as anticipated, with recurring revenues growing low single digits, again benefited by high retention rates and high levels of recurring revenue. This segment underperformed our expectations primarily due to Transcore's New York congestion infrastructure project timing. In April, we expected approximately $75 million more in revenue from this project than actually occurred in 2020. More on this when we turn to the segment overview, but we expect this $75 million of pushed revenue to be recognized in 21. It's also worth noting that the number of toll tags shipped last year were at historic lows given the lower traffic volumes, but this was anticipated. For our MAS segment, We've talked all year about this being the tale of four situations, Verathon, other medical products, Neptune, and industrial. For the year, again, back in April, we felt this group would be flat to up mid-single digits on an organic basis. We posted 1% growth. We feel very good about the execution across this group of companies. The primary reconciliation factor is a slower recovery ramp tied to our non verathon medical product businesses and Neptune. Specifically, we anticipated unprecedented demand for Verathon's innovation product family. For the year, Verathon grew substantially as COVID accelerated the further adoption of video intubation as the preferred technology. Our other medical product businesses which grow mid-single digits like clockwork, were down mid-single digits for the year, tied directly to lower elective procedure volumes and limited hospital capital spending. Interestingly, interestingly for Neptune, we highlighted municipal budget uncertainty in April. This proved generally to be a non-factor as municipalities' budgets were approved and available. However, the impact of the lockdowns, especially in the Northeast U.S. and Canada, had a prolonged impact on our customers' ability to do routine meter replacements. As a result, Neptune was down low double digits for the year, slightly worse than our initial expectations. Finally, for this segment, we expected sharp industrial declines, and that is what happened, with these businesses being down low double digits for the year. That said, we are seeing sequential quarterly improvements across both Neptune and our industrial businesses. Finally, and as it relates to our process tech segment, we expected to be down 20 to 25 percent, and we were, logging in at down 21 percent. This played out as we anticipated with much lower energy-related spending, project timing pushes, and the inability to get field service resources into customer locations. So this is the play-by-play -play rewind for 2020. Now let's turn to the segment pages for a bit more detail. Next slide, please. For application software, where revenues here were 1.81 billion, up 1% organically, with EBITDA of 772 million. The broad macro activity for this segment has remained quite consistent for much of 2020. Specifically, we continue to see accelerating demand for our cloud solutions. This bodes well for our long-term recurring revenue growth and customer intimacy. At a business unit level, Deltec's GovCon business continues to be super solid and grow very nicely. But we did see some headwinds relative to their offerings that target the consulting, marketing services, and AEC space. That said, recent customer activity and top of funnel activity suggest some market thawing is occurring. Adderant and power plan delivered flat EBITDA in a year with nice recurring revenue gains. We experienced very nice growth across our lab software group, again, doing our part to help fight the COVID war. Strata delivered double digit organic growth and completed a strategic acquisition in EPSI. Notably, the combined business will analyze roughly half of the U.S. hospital spend. Finally, 
Our two businesses that serve the education space, Seaboard and Horizon, declined to double digits in the year simply due to having a customer base that was shut down. A decent amount of revenues in these businesses are tied to student volumes. Importantly, we acquired Vertifor last year. They're off to a great start with strong earnings and very strong cash flow in the fourth quarter. Looking to Q1, we see flat to low single digit organic growth based on continued mid single digit recurring revenue growth, offset slightly by lower perpetual and services revenues given last year's non-COVID comp. Now let's turn to our network segment. Here, revenues were 1.74 billion up 3% on an organic basis with EBITDA of $732 million. Our network software businesses performed well during last year, growing low single digits. Specifically, DAT was strong, growing double digits. DAT's network scale and innovation focus continues to enable very solid organic gains. Construct Connect grew based on network utilization tied to a tighter construction labor market iTrade, MHA, and Foundry had some headwinds tied to their end markets being disrupted due to COVID. That said, each of these businesses had high retention rates and the networks remained very strong. iPipeline also performed well during their first year being with Roper and completed two bolt-on acquisitions. Our non-software business, businesses struggled a bit during the year. Specifically, RF ideas, RF ideas our multi-protocol credential reader business did well in their healthcare applications, but was hampered by meaningful declines in their secure print market. For the full year, Transcore pushed about 100 million of revenue out of 2020 into 21 associated with their New York project. In addition, EBITDA margins were pressured due to lower tag shipments and a few non-New York project pushouts. As we look to the first quarter of 2021, we see organic revenue, as you can see in the lower right-hand box, to be down 3 to 5% for the quarter. An important distinction to highlight, our software businesses will continue to grow in the low single-digit range, but our non-software businesses, driven by Transcore, will decline in the high teens range in the first quarter due to much lower anticipated tag shipments and timing of revenue associated with the New York project. As a reminder, the first quarter of this year is coming off a mid-teens growth comp from a year ago. Now let's turn to our MAS segment. Revenues for the year were $1.47 billion, up 1% on an organic basis with EBITDA $508 million. Verathon was awesome in 2020. The business grew substantially based on unprecedented demand for their video intubation product line. Demand was global. Given Verathon's ability to fulfill this demand, we expect our meaningfully expanded install base of GlideScopes to generate increased levels of reoccurring consumables pull-through in the years to come. In addition, the first year of their single-use bronchoscope release was successful. We believe we gained a substantial foothold in the market during the inaugural year of this product category. Our other med product businesses declined, but they started to see more normalized patient volumes towards the end of the year. Further, customer interactions are starting to resemble more normal levels of engagement. Neptune declined low double digits tied exclusively to our customers in the northeastern U.S. and Canada not having access to indoor meters. Other regions were flat during 2020. Neptune's market share remained strong throughout the year. Finally, our industrial businesses were down, but have shown sequential improvements throughout the year. For Q1, we expect low single-digit organic growth for this segment with similar patterns to that of the fourth quarter. Now let's turn to our final segment, Process Tech. Revenues for the year were $519 million, down 21% on an organic basis with EBITDA of $156 million, or 30% of revenue. Compared versus two years ago, these businesses are down about $90 million in EBITDA and yet maintained 30% EBITDA margins. Congrats and thanks to our leadership team for their continued exceptional execution. 
As a side note, Roper continued to compound despite these cyclical headwinds. That said, this segment is pretty straightforward and has been the same story all year. COVID has negatively impacted our oil and gas and short cycle businesses. Certainly, low oil prices did not help either. That said, we have seen some green shoots across this group as capital spending started to improve as we exited 2020. As we look to the first quarter, we expect declines to moderate in the first quarter to be in the 10% range. Importantly, we have easing comps as we enter the second quarter. Also, over the last couple years, these businesses continue to make product and channel investments to be best positioned to fully capture this cyclical upswing. The next few years here should be pretty good. Now let's turn to our guidance and the associated framework. While this slide is somewhat busy, we wanted to line up for you the key macro differences between our 2021 full year outlook on a segment basis versus our actual 2020 results. In aggregate, we expect total revenue to increase in the mid-teens range with organic growth being in the mid-single digit plus area. As we look across the revenue streams for our application software segment, we expect mid-singles growth. Specifically, we expect a slightly improved recurring revenue growth rate aided by last year's recurring momentum and an increased mix towards SaaS. We expect flat services revenues and mid-single digit plus growth in perpetual as we expect a modest market recovery and easing second half comps. Similarly, we expect mid-single digit organic growth in our network segment with our network software businesses growing mid-single digit plus. We expect Transcore to complete the New York project and see recovering tag sales. When combined, Transcore should grow mid-singles for the year. We expect Mass to grow mid-single digits as well. Our medical product businesses were exceptional last year, up 20%. Importantly, the quality of our medical products revenue stream will continue to improve as Verathon's reoccurring revenue streams tied to Glidescope and Bflex continue to gain momentum. As we look to 2021, our medical product businesses are expected to grow low single digits as elective procedures and hospital capital spending return to more normalized levels throughout 2021, this return being partially offset by our difficult 2020 COVID comp. Neptune should be a high single digits plus with easing restrictions and more access to indoor meter replacements. And finally, our industrial businesses should recover and grow in the high single digit plus range after two years of declines. Our PT businesses are expected to be up high single digits through the year based on the resumption of deferred projects and field maintenance, as well as modest improvements in these end markets. So all in all, we expect organic revenues to increase mid single digits plus and total revenue to grow in the mid teens range. Let's turn to our guidance slide. Based on what we just outlined, when you roll everything together, we're establishing our 2021 full year adjusted depth guidance to be in the range of 1435 and 1475. Our tax rate should be in the 21 to 22% range. For the first quarter, we're establishing adjusted depth guidance to be between 326 and 332. Of note, our guided Q1 adjusted depths is roughly 22 to 23% of our full year guidance range and is consistent with our long-term historical depth seasonality. Now let's turn to our summary and get to your questions. What a year, none of us will ever forget 2020. Our business performed so very well last year. We grew revenue 3% in aggregate and only declined a single percent on an organic basis. EBITDA margins were steady at 35.8% and cash flow grew 16% to 1.7 billion. This means we had cash flow margins of 30%. Just amazing. Given this performance, our business model's ability to foresee these, this performance, we stayed focused on executing our capital deployment strategy, which resulted in $6 billion of deployment on high quality, niche leading vertical software companies. There is no doubt the quality of our enterprise improved during 2020 something we're incredibly proud to be able to say. Our recurring revenue grew mid-single digits. We increased innovation investments 
and increase the quality of our portfolio with our capital deployment spends. So as we look to 2021, we feel we are incredibly well positioned. We expect strong organic growth that will be further augmented by contributions from our recent acquisitions. In 2021, we expect about two-thirds of our EBITDA to come from our software businesses, which provide just all the virtues of an increased mix towards recurring revenues. We will continue to focus on deleveraging our balance sheet, but we remain committed and focused on our long-term capital deployment strategy. To this end, our pipeline of M&A candidates is active, robust, and has many high-quality opportunities. So as we look back over 2020, we're proud of our business model's durability and our leaders' ability to successfully navigate last year's uncertainties. We are proud that we continue to be forward-leaning and strategic. We are proud that we improved our business last year with an increasing mix of growing recurring revenue and continued innovation focus. In short, we got bigger and better during 2020. As we turn to your questions, I'll remind everyone that at Roper, we operate a low-risk model whose strategy centers on acquiring fantastic businesses and then providing them with an environment where they can get even better over the long arc of time. This was certainly the case in 2020. So with that, let's turn to our first question. We will now go to our question and answer portion of the call. We request that our callers limit their questions to one main question and one follow-up. If you would like to ask a question, you may do so by pressing the star key followed by the number one on your touchtone phone. If you are using a speaker phone, please pick up your handset before pressing the key. To withdraw your question, please press star then the number two. Again, we request that callers limit their questions to one main question and one follow-up. The first question today comes from Dean Dre of RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Hey, good morning, Dean. Good morning, Dean. Hey, I really appreciate all the new disclosures you're providing here, especially pages 14 and 20, those bridges between your original guidance, what you delivered, and then the organic bridge on 20 is really helpful. A lot of granularity there. Hey, and if we were to start, um, just because the New York City contract is such a high profile and it, and it did have a swing factor, um, can you give us a sense of uh, how much, uh, just remind us of the revenue you're expecting for the year, how much of it could land in the first quarter, and just confirm there's been no change in scope. Yeah, so, uh, hey, Dean, good morning. It, it's about $100 million, uh, for the full year, and in the first quarter, we only have about 10 to 15 in there. As we mentioned, there's a bit of a pause, but now it's started up and running again, and the scope is unchanged. Got it. And if you were to highlight all the areas you know, uh, where you're seeing improvement in licenses and uh, the services pipeline, you know, what's at the high end uh, in terms of the businesses today? Yeah, Dean, I, I, uh, maybe if I can ask you to sort of rephrase the question, I want to make sure that we, we fully understand the question. Yeah, just in terms of uh, the licenses revenues that you're seeing today, um, you've taken us through you know, where some of the challenges have been. What's on the, uh, the, the upper end of your guidance uh, where you would see potentially the, 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 how it would play out on the positive side? Sure, half, okay. So um, appreciate the question. I think we understand it now. So the total perpetual revenue for our core businesses, that the software businesses that have been in the portfolio for a while was down, um, obviously, in 2020. We expect about the recovery in 21 to be about half of what we are down. Um, we're seeing strength. You know, we've seen continued strength all year in the perpetual in 2020 in the perpetual book of business and Dell Tech's GovCon business. As I, as I talked about in the uh, in the prepared remarks, we're seeing thawing and some and some activity in their professional services and markets. That's encouraging. Uh, these are the architects, the engineers, the contractors, the marketing services firms, the consulting firms. Those those that book of business. In addition, the other large parts of the perpetual book are at Adderant and power plan. Adderant has its own unique set of competitive factors where the customers 
have to the customers that have not upgraded their software from the, the competitive customers that have not upgraded their software have to upgrade and we're winning you know a large percentage of those and so all that activity just got pushed to the right a bit and that's uh somewhat encouraging and pipeline activity is is positive there and then power plans um pipeline activity is uh is full it has a handful of large opportunities in it, which are obviously hard to you know, predict the exact timing. But we actually like the pipeline built across the, the companies that have the primary book of perpetual business. Okay, that's helpful. And just as my follow-up question be for Rob, uh, do you have specific deleveraging plans for the year uh, that you could share with us in terms of it, you know, where and how you said you'd be paying down the revolver, but just are there specific goals that you can share uh, for 2021? Sure. So it'll be, as you know, when we're in deleveraging mode, all the free cash flow goes towards deleveraging. So, you know, we, we pay a dividend that'll continue, but essentially the rest of the free cash flow goes towards deleveraging. So, you know, that's a rough, you know, probably after you're paying a dividend, you know, roughly a billion and a half of deleveraging is probably a, a good ballpark number. Next question comes from Christopher Glenn of Oppenheimer. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks. Good morning. Um, Good morning. So, congrats on all the capital allocation last year. Um, I'm just curious if you're getting a lot of inbounds after some of your sub segment divisions, you know, given you had some real emphasis on the quality and fullness of the pipeline, uh, there's certainly liquidity in the markets. Um, so wondering if your calculus has shifted towards, you know, any non-operating cash flow to fund the deleverage and trade it back into the pipeline a little sooner. Yeah, I appreciate the question. We, it's very routine for us to get inbounds. Um, you know, I've been here almost 10 years and there's, there's a handful of what I would say, I would say meaningful and credible inbounds in any given year. Um, like we said for years, though, it's just very difficult to make the math work because when we sell a business, you know, look, just look back at Catan, you sell a business to a strategic buyer, we leak taxes, then you have to redeploy it. It's just hard with a compounding orientation to make that math work. Certainly the lower tax rate sort of helped in the Catan timing. So, yes, we get inbounds. I would not say the activity in the last you know, few quarters is ramped up more than it's been over the decade I've been here. But, yeah, they're always, there's always inbound inquiry. And appetite to entertain that uh, was the other part of that question. Yeah, I think it's the appetite. You know, we've never not had the appetite. It just comes down to the math and, and doing what's best, in our view, according to our math for our shareholders. So it's the appetite is is remained unchanged. Un understood. Thanks. You're welcome. The next question is from Steve Tusa of JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Hey guys, good morning. Hey Steve. Um, the free cash is pretty strong in the fourth quarter. Uh, you know, like almost 95% of uh, of EBITDA. Um, you know, last couple fourth quarters, it's been around 80%. What what was the kind of overdrive there? And then uh, when it comes to um, cash and EBITDA, how much did roughly did uh, Vertifor add? Uh, Vertifor was around 90 or so of, of both uh, cash and EBITDA. And uh, yeah, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Steve, just great working capital performance across the portfolio, very broad based. Uh, you know, you're getting your software renewals, which were very strong in the fourth quarter. Uh, you cer there certainly is some benefit, right, from those more cyclical businesses <clears throat> being a little bit uh, softer, right, and that, that lowers working capital uh, overall. But just great working capital performance. Our cash taxes year over year were about flat, so it really was all on working capital. Got it. And then um, it, it, within the, the guidance, I guess you, you didn't really quite – you don't usually guide for free cash flow – for next year, um, I think you said a billion five. Is that is the billion the billion five is after the dividend, and then um, does that include any of the the tax benefit um, that you guys bought with Vertifor? The benefit of that? Yeah, so the billion five is a deleveraging number, so that's an estimate. That's that's after paying dividends. Um, so for next year, yeah, you're right. We don't guide free cash flow. 
Um, we always have very strong conversion, as you know. We expect that uh, very high conversion to continue. <clears throat> Uh, as I mentioned, those working capital um, trends are very sustainable, right? It's the culture, it's the type of businesses we buy. As the software businesses grow, their working capital continues to go down. So that all should continue. Uh, um, in terms of the tax attributes, uh, yes, there are some tax attributes uh, related uh, to Vertifor, which we disclosed, a little over $100 million. So there'll be some benefit from that coming uh, in 21. Uh, there's also, like many other multi-industry and really all companies, right, we benefited some from deferral of payroll taxes. Uh, so that'll go back the other way next year as you're, as you're starting to pay those payroll taxes again. Um, so those are sort of, you know, those will sort of counter each other a little bit. Um, but we feel great about cash flow next year, but, you know, we don't, we don't guide, as you know. Next question comes from Allison Polinak of Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Good morning. Um, just want to talk to you. You know, obviously the theme of reopening seems uh, pretty pervasive in a number of your businesses. You know, could you, you help me understand maybe the progression um, of some of those businesses that you're thinking about? You know, if we, in fact we do start to reopen here, is it sort of an outsized bump? You know, as as things start to get back to work, or is it more of a progression out of that? Any thoughts? Well, I'll give you the. Uh, I'll guess, Neil. I'll give you the, the the headline, and I'll let Rob sort of add his color in the back end. So it's not a uh, like a step function bump up. It is a sort of sequential improvement throughout the year. Obviously, when you roll past Q1, the comps get a whole lot easier. So that's that's part of what the uh, what the, the the last three quarters of the year will look like as well. When you look at it on a company by company or sort of segment by segment basis, just rolling through, you know. Basically, it's the perpetual book of business and the associated services that come with that for application software that ramps back up. Um, and network, they're really, um, for the network businesses, it's a little bit of ramp back at Foundry. It's a little bit, bit of ramp back at, um, at iTrade. But the other businesses were, you know, pretty steady as she goes, DAT, Construct Connect, et cetera. Transcore stands by itself. It's tied principally to uh, two things. One is the New York project completing, and second, the return of traffic volumes and the, and the t associated tags that go with them. For, uh, for the MAS segment, it's Neptune just sequentially coming back and importantly getting the, the access to the indoor meters in Northeast U.S. and Canada. Um, I said in the prepared remarks, market share was super steady maybe plus a little bit in that business last year. Um, it's just access, our customers getting access to do routine replacements. Um, Verathon will have a, a difficult headwind because of the capital place we talked about, but the other medical product businesses just um, rotate up in a sequential basis. And then finally, uh, the industrial businesses do the same. Process is uh, much like industrial, just a cyclical rebound, modestly higher oil prices help. But you have all this um, in the in the energy businesses, you have all this deferred maintenance that's got to get done. You know, there's a lot of there's a sort of a, there were some restocking orders in fourth quarter there, and then some pipeline activity. Like we got to get in and do the maintenance um, in a handful of these important customers. So that'd be sort of the color of the ramp, but no step function. But Rob, what would you add if anything? No, I think that's right. You know, we're assuming you know, Q1 is very much you know clearly still in the middle of pandemic, and then things improve from there. Got it. And then in, in line with that, you know, obviously we've been under this closure for a significant amount of time. You know, any concerns of the financial impact to some of your existing customers that you would anticipate that ramp from or, you know, not at this point? I would say no. And I think the, you know, I mean, obviously there's going to be small pockets here and there. Um, we're very, um, most of our customers across the portfolio, most are enterprise level. A very small percentage of our software companies would be in the small, medium size, where it may be more subject to some sort of uh, macro sort of headwinds or, or business uncertainty. Um, I think the data point we point to is just the incredible cash flow. I mean, we got paid by our customers, right? And so uh, last year, and so what we do is just critical to what they do. And, uh, no, I don't think there's going to be a yeah, the, You know, the pockets of areas that are hit, as we talked about, right, colleges and universities, uh, most of those customers, we tend to have larger customers there, um, you know, so we're not too worried about our, uh, our schools being in financial trouble overall. And then on, like, the iTrade network side, they have uh, customers that are in the food area, so there certainly could be an impact from some, some smaller restaurants and some of those 
uh, issues in that market, but overall not really meaningful impact to us. The next question comes from Joe Giordano of Cowan. Please go ahead. Hey guys, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Joe. Hey, I'm in the I'm in the market to uh, refinance my mortgage at one percent blended. So can you guys help me out with that? <laughs> I have a guy in Florida. No, never mind. That's right. <laughs> um, we won't count that the, as a first question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on the networking capital, you know, obviously that keeps getting more and more negative and more interesting. But like with the current portfolio, like it, where's that? Where's like the maximum that that can get to without doing more deals into in, that further push it that way? Yeah, so I think if you go to our working capital page, page 10, you'll see all the benefit here. Q4 to Q4 was on the liability side, right? We're basically equal to uh, on the on the asset side, which is that that indicates to us. And when you go business by business, it's structural and driven by an increasing mix towards software. So that's the first thing I'd say. Second is when you look at the art of the possible, if you think about a business that is 100% SaaS recurring revenue that's prepaid a year ahead, let's say that you bill on January 1st and you take 90 days to get paid, that company is going to have 75% of its revenue. That's negative networking capital, right? And we certainly have a couple businesses that don't quite get the 75%, but they approach you know 40 or 50%. So as we become more software, and our, and our legacy perpetual business becomes more SaaS, you're going to see this number get higher. Will it ever get to 40 or 50? No, it won't. But it'll keep inching higher. It should over the next, you know, five to 10 years. Uh, we don't have a target. You know, it's, it's, it's not that we're trying to drive the business to be X percent negative. We just have an incentive system and a culture that we get a little bit better every year on this metric. That's definitely helpful to frame that, to frame that out. Thanks. Um, I, uh, the follow-up would be on Verta. Uh, I'm sorry, on, on um, Verta Four. Um, how's that business doing since you've been there? Have you noticed anything like kind of what kind of initial changes have been instituted, if any? And like when we did our diligence, that was definitely a market like where that business was a leader, but there was it, that whole market seemed ripe for some change there. And you know, how how are you guys approaching that? Uh, are there upstarts that you look at? Is it an internal change that drives the market forward? Like, how are you just approaching that business now? Yeah, so the most important thing that I think we can say in regards to Verta for that matter, any acquisition is that, you know, if we had to summarize what we do is we buy these amazingly great businesses and then provide them environment to get better over a long period of time. So as a result, there is not a short-term We've got to do these five things to improve the business. That's, that's not in our, in our strategic M&A strategy. That said, um, the business is, uh, as in the piece of research you did, we thought was quite good and reflective of ours. You know, it's, it's basically a duopoly. You know, we share a market with one principal competitor on the agency side. Fortunately for us, um, just after the, the, the business, we acquired the business and closed, we won the largest deal in the market um, in the last three or four years and assured partners. There's a press release that went out a hand, handful of weeks ago. So we're delighted about that. It's a slow ramp over a couple years, a couple, three years. But I think that's just an indication of, of the quality of the business that Vertifor and the products they have, but also the, the customer in that case was reassured by being, by Vertifor being owned by Roper, who's just a long-term owner that's not going to look to sell the business in a handful of years, and therefore you can make the right investments. Um, if there is one thing that we're, you know, if, if you will, doing in the short run is based on our diligence and, and, and similar to work you did is we wanted to allocate a little bit more um, to R&D, uh, which we have done. That's reflected in the numbers we've given you from the very beginning. And so that's going to take a few years to play out, just continuing to, to add functionality and add features and, and ways to monetize their customer base. Hey, and Joe, just on the, obviously the company's performed very, very well since we own it, but just to clarify my last answer, the 90 of EBITDA, that's since we own the business, so there was a month in there as well. It wasn't all in the fourth quarter, but it was 90 of cash in the fourth quarter. The next question comes from Blake Sendron of Wolf Research. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Good morning. I um, want to follow up on that R&D comment, actually, kind of in the broader context of your, your portfolio. So, you know, COVID was disruptive uh, for, for a number of reasons, structurally with the end markets, and, and I would imagine competitively 
In addition to Vertifor and, and maybe ramping R&D there, are there any opportunities to ramp R&D across some of the other business units simply because there's new market opportunities as a result of the pandemic moving forward? I know it's hard for us to really uh, fully fully appreciate all the changes that'll that'll stick structurally across all your business units, but I'm just wondering if we should expect R&D to, uh, to ramp a little bit across the portfolio and not just Vertifor. Yeah, so a few things I'd, I'd, I'd say there to begin with. First is uh, when, we, when we engage with each of our businesses strategically, we talk to them broadly about how to grow sustainably with CRI accretive growth over a long arc of time, um, answering the two questions of where to play and how to win. But then when you get into how to win, it is some, some, sometimes it's a product answer. A lot of times it's a go-to-market or market, go-to-market effective sort of answer. So it's not our strategic orientation of each business doesn't narrow into innovation from the, from the get-go. That said, you know, obviously innovation and R&D, we're mostly a D shop, mostly development um, across our software businesses. You, you have seen and likely will continue to see a modest uh, increase in R&D uh, spend, you know, as a percent of revenue for years to come. In 19, it was about 7.5%. Last year, is about a little over 8. This coming year, we're probably going to add about 100 basis points, be a little over 9 there's a Vertifor mix in there that they have a little bit higher percentage as, as, as compared to some of our other businesses. But I think you will see and are seeing an increase uh, in innovation um, there. The, uh, so I I'd sort of stop there. I mean, if you have any faults, we're happy to, happy to do it. But the short answer is yes. I guess there's one other thing. If you compare the Ropers, you know, the 8 or 9% of, of revenue that we spend in R&D, uh, compared to other software companies, it appears low. When you look at our software businesses, we're right in line with the peers. We're between 10 and 15, 17%, depending on the company. The application businesses tend to be on the higher side of that. The network businesses t tend to be on the, on the lower side of that. And the reason the mix for Roper is low is because we have a, a, you know, a quite a bit of revenue in Transcore, MHA, and others that effectively don't have any R&D in their business model. So uh, it's always important to point out when we get asked a question about R&D. No, that's, help, that's helpful to think about the framework there. I uh, wanted to shift to Dell Tech because I thought it was interesting when you mentioned uh, GovCon stability versus maybe some of the professional services being impacted by COVID. Um, you know, the GovCon, I would imagine you're, you're dealing with large uh, enterprise customers, so we should expect it to be kind of stable in addition to just general government spending being stable. On the professional side, is it just a matter of the reopening um, or, you know, is there anything we can think about with respect to customer size, large versus SMB, uh, and then maybe end markets specifically that we should be looking at for the recovery? Is it just, you know, non-residential construction on the AEC side? You know, how should we think about Dell Tech improvement uh, in 2021 and beyond? I'll give you a gold star for getting like seven questions into one question. So I'm going to do, do our best <laughs> to try to come tick through these. So on Dell Tech, it is it's important to note, it is a combination of large enterprise and the smaller end of the GovCon space that's been super strong throughout the year. It's not just been at the high end. Uh, and yes, we expect that to just continue as the, uh, it's not tied to infrastructure, if you know, per se. You know, these government contractors go to where the fast currents of government spend is. You know, it's gone from military to education to maybe infrastructure. They just go to where it is. That might drive some M&A activity, by the way, which is generally good for us. On the professional services side, the book of business here is, is, is broad, but if there are pockets of concentration, it's in architects, engineers, and contractors. Um, obviously, uh, the contractors, mostly non-res contractors in this case, they are the ones that are a little bit worried, and they've sort of you know, tightened up a little bit more. It's the architects and engineering firms that have shown some green shoots here in Q4. Um, in addition, marketing services firms um, is, a, is a leading niche uh, for Dell Tech, and those businesses also have started to thaw. Um, so I think that checked off your questions. If we missed one or two, we're happy to follow up with you after the call. The next question comes from Julian Mitchell of Barclays. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Jao on for Julian. Good morning. Uh, maybe to start with, can we get your thoughts on, you know, maybe margin expectations uh, for the segments? Obviously, a lot of movement uh, in the software margins in 2020, kind of a lot of mix shifts you guys are calling out on that slide 20. So I just wanted to get your thoughts there. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we can go through the segments in detail uh, later on, but I mean, overall, our margins are relatively flat year over year uh, in the guide. I think there's a little bit of a core, uh, de you know, decline in the margins given a lot of the cost uh, will come back post COVID travel and things that didn't happen. Um, you know, very modest decline mm -hmm. there. And then uh, the vertifor revenue comes in at a higher margin. So overall, you know, margins are relatively flat. Um, and then, you know, we'd, we'd expect some improvement in the, in the bottom, sort of the, the more cyclical type stuff and process. We should get some nice bounce back as that starts to grow in margins. And if I could just add one thing there, sort of piggybacking your, your question with the last one, you know, core EBITDA margins are going to be down a, a bit um, because, as Rob said, these, uh, these costs are coming back in. It's hard to spend money on travel and customer meetings, for instance, last year. We expect some of that to come back in this year. That said, I sort of call it like a, a trap of leadership. You know, we're increasing our R&D as a percent of revenue by about the same amount that we expect the core margins to come down. So there's going to be some, some teams and some companies may choose to hold margins and they're going to have to, gonna, there's an opportunity cost inside the business somewhere. In our case, we're very specifically and intentionally not doing that or succumbing to that trap. And then obviously we get the benefit of the vertifor mix coming in. So on a, on a in aggregate margin should be flat to up a touch. Perfect. Thanks. And then maybe on the, you know, services piece of application software, you guys talk about kind of rebuilding that pipeline. Um, what does that process look like and any thoughts on some of the cadence or just kind of expectations beyond that sort of flat growth you guys got it for? Yeah, I think so. What, what, what you have here is a dynamic where, the most first as a as a precursor most the vast majority i should say of our services work in the application segment are tied to new implementations whether they're uh, SaaS or on premise so if you look back and think through what happened sequentially in 2020 very quickly um, in the shutdown the license activity the perpetual activity slowed down um, so you had, you know, low license activity, basically Q through Q through Q4. The services book of business has a little bit of a backlog, right? So the services work continued in Q2, continued a little bit in Q3 to you completed the in-flight projects. And then it sort of slowed down, you know, a handful of months behind the license activity. So when you come back on this side, the license activity will pick up sooner, but then you got to, and the services work will follow back behind it. So you've essentially had a slower ramp down and a slower ramp up for services. So that's why you see it flattish where you can see growth in the perpetual book. The next question comes from Alex Blanton of Clear Harbor Asset Management. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Good morning, Alex. Uh, hey, good morning, Alex. Good to hear you. Uh, I wanted to ask, could you characterize your, uh, your acquisition intentions for 2021? You had said earlier that it would be primarily it'd be deleveraging for 12 to 18 months, um, but today you mentioned that you had a very active, robust pipeline of uh, potential acquisitions with many opportunities. So, uh, has there been a change in your in your intentions there? Uh, in terms of deleveraging, how would you characterize the acquisition outlook for this year? Thank you, Alex, for the question. So I would I would I would share two things with you. First, is we are we or maybe more maybe more than a couple things. So we are active. The pipeline is active. Um, we are spending time uh, with with under learning businesses. You know, spending time with all the sponsors that we have relationships with to understand what the cohort of opportunities looks like. Importantly, every sizable transaction that we've completed since 2016, we have had a chance to meet the management teams at least once, if not multiple times, anywhere between six and 18 months before we completed the transaction. So the work that we're doing now is principally focused on that. These are, these are getting, to, getting to understand businesses well before they're ready to be transacted, right? So businesses we're meeting you know, this month are likely going to be businesses that we may acquire at the end of this year or into you know, the first half of next year. So it's the early pipeline work is the first thing I would say. Second is we're absolutely committed to deleveraging or, or unwavering on that. Third thing, if the right deal came through, there's always a way to figure that out. 
but that's not our, our primary focus. Our primary focus is the early part of the pipeline build as well as the, uh, as well as the deleveraging. Okay, and secondly, uh, how would you uh, characterize the makeup of these companies that you're getting to know? Uh, what industries, is it still primarily software? Uh, you're still going in that direction? Uh, absolutely. You know, it's again, we're characterized, our MA pipeline and process characterized by buying businesses that are better than us through the, our quantitative cash return lens. So that, that yields mostly software informatics types businesses. Um, they're a combination of, you know, a wide variety of end markets, a wide variety of SaaS versus perpetual business models. Um, but uh, yeah, it's essentially what the capital deployment over the last, you know, seven to 10 years, it's what our pipeline is characterized by that same type of business. This concludes our question and answer session. We will now return back to Zach Moxie for any closing remarks. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We look forward to speaking with you during our next earnings call. The conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.